It's July 6th, 2023. This is Rook. Welcome to episode 271 of Rook. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Hello to you from Toronto. Salam, Dustan Aziz. Durud Bashama. Hope you're doing well wherever you're tuning in from around the world. We are on our ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. Hello, Smart Pega here in the studio. Hello. Do I sound breathier than normal? A little bit. Yeah, it's the asthma. Yeah. It's the bronchial. How are you feeling? Well, I have asthma. <laughs> well, you've always had asthma, but that's right. It's, you and know. I have it still. still. It didn't go away. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. Actually, years of broadcasting on the CBC, mm-hmm. and people would write in and be like, "I loved it." Actually, if somebody on Twitter was like, "Why is he so breathy?" And then I'd be like, um, "Do you always speak that way to people who have asthma?" <laughs> I would use it as a way to make them feel horrible about that's themselves. Right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. To, to induce some sympathy. Um, but anyway, I, I march on with yes. my puffers. Coming up mm-hmm. on this program, legendary Iranian-American journalist Homo Sarshar yes. joins us for a feature interview from Los Angeles. She was on the show three years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's three years since Homo has been on the show, and she I'm very happy to have her coming back on. She just last week received um, another Lifetime Achievement Award, this one at uh, Stanford University. Mm-hmm. Um, and she deserves it, you know, because, uh, and I know there's some people who have different opinions about her opinions, but this is somebody who has been uh, working in Persian media, or at least serving the Iranian mm-hmm. community in Iran and outside of Iran for, for almost 60 years. I wow. mean, can you imagine? Yeah. Uh, and, and you know how hard it is to do that in the Iranian space. So Absolutely. she started in <laughs> Iran. Um, she, she was the editor of Zane Ruz, and then she worked at Cahon for many mm-hmm. years. And then, of course, with the coming of uh, the revolution, she was kind of forced into exile, right. comes to the Los Angeles, and for 40 years works as uh, a journalist, has this radio show that she was doing for many years on the, on the weekend. Uh, I don't think she ever made much money doing this mm-hmm. in, the, in the diaspora. And I know she has said she doesn't care about that. I think she should care about that. I think she would have deserved to, to make mm-hmm. a lot of money. But, but um, a couple of years ago, she uh, retired from her radio show said, okay, I'm, you know, I'm in my mid-70s and right. that's it. And, uh, uh, well, she has hardly disappeared. I mean, she's almost more active than ever right. doing a number of things. And she's been very active both doing interviews, giving interviews mm-hmm. um, about her ideas because she's pretty tapped into the, the diaspora, et cetera, and, and, and the situation in Iran uh, through the uprising. So for mm-hmm. the last 10 months, you would have heard things from Homo Sarshore, and she doesn't shy away from opinion. And she... Um, and she, she, you know, she, she comes from a very, uh, a real professional journalist place of, of, um, um, you know, believes in very honest reporting. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of the things I'm going to ask her about is the last time she was on the show, I said, uh, would you, would you interview Zarif? He was the foreign minister at the time. Right. This question of whether we should platform these people from the Mm -hmm. regime, you know, and at the time she said, Absolutely. Of course I would, you know, oh. we should, we should interview whoever we can. I mean, let them expose themselves, et cetera. Now, you know how I feel about Absolutely. this more recently. And, and we talked about it on the show about yes. Christian Amanpour interviewing the, what's the buffoon guy? <laughs> Abdul Ab- something. Abdul Ab- Ali Ra- Halion. Yeah. 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 That guy. I, I'm intentionally not saying his name right. The, because at some point does it, who does it benefit to have these, give mm-hmm. these people a platform? Um, I want to talk to her about that. Yeah. Ask her, you know, as a media person to media person, journalist to journalist, do you still think we should invite, would she interview anyone from the regime? Mm-hmm. Would she had given the opportunity and knowing that they're going to spout lies? Uh, and I certainly understand her position from a journalistic standpoint. Of, right. Yes, let's invite it, anyone into the studio, but who do you give a platform to, mm-hmm. et cetera. So we'll get to all of that. Uh, with Homo Sashar. In the meantime, here in the Rook studio, a special guest who is also joining us. She is raising, are you doing a dance move? I'm, I'm, I'm doing <laughs> some, like, this is the lighting that is, that oh, is going on. I see, on you're creating lighting with your hands. <laughs> <Yes>. Broadcaster, <laughs> producer, 
musician to i mean this this woman does it all she's also a, a bit of a pretentious hipster <laughs> <laughs> Maral Mohammadi is in the Rook studio. Hello, hello. And not only are you in the Rook studio, you are in Canada. I am. For your first time ever. I am, yes. This is, this is my first time You're in Canada. You're a British Iranian. Yes. Who doesn't visit the colonies very often. Well, <laughs> as long as, you know, they're doing their thing and give us the tax that they, they need to give us as our colonies. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't need to go and visit everywhere that we own, everywhere <laughs> that we've colonized. Imagine if I had to go and visit them all. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you. Uh, as somebody, first of all, the, the fact that you would even come in here, given your hipster kind of status. <laughs> uh, you, I, well, thank you that, for that inviting we make the, me, despite my you know, hipsterness we, yes, and, and well, pretentiousness. I, we made the cut, you know, basically, <laughs> for you to come visit. Uh, how are you feeling? First of all, and by the way, it's great to see you. And I, I've mentioned this a couple of times on the air. I don't know if you ever heard it, but your version uh, of Bad Oh Yeah you did this thing with um, with Sherman's song. Mm. And, and one of the things, I've, I've said this a few times, people might get tired of me saying it, but I didn't love when people would cover the song, like mm. would just take the song and mm -hmm. then change the lyrics, do their mm. own thing or do it in English or whatever. But I, but I liked, uh, I really liked what you and some others did, which is you basically took his song, song and you accompanied him mm. as if you were on the cello, as if mm. you were recording with him. Mm. And I thought it was very beautiful. Thank you. It was... It was a very, I mean, I guess for everybody, it was a very, very emotional um, time. It was very difficult. And for, for us being away from Iran, we had different kinds of difficulties to, to people who were fighting in the streets inside yes. Iran. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, this, this feeling of helplessness that you can't really do anything. You can't even mourn with them. You can't sing with them. There's nothing that you can really contribute. Um, um, or just or just hold hands with them, yes. and this for me was just holding hands with them, being being a part of um, part of the thing that they were trying to yeah. um, kind of uh, uh, um, what's the word um, achieve achieve uh. or or make like the things that they wanted to say. Mm. I wanted to kind of hold their hand while they yeah, were saying it yeah. instead of you spoke and supported it. with your music yes and i remember actually in the early months of the uprising i contacted you a few a few times mm. you're a broadcaster said hey come on the show talk about and you said i, I just have nothing to say i'm so upset yeah. i can't talk I, I don't have anything to talk about uh, yeah it was it, like i i at the time i would have only been able to talk about how awful i am feeling yeah. and i thought it is how awful I'm feeling right. is a joke. It's all about morale. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. I, it, it's not yeah. the time for me to talk about how yeah. I'm feeling. We all, we, we just need to focus on what's happening there and what people are doing inside Iran and, and, and kind of be the speaker for them, not just say, oh my God, I'm, I'm just so sad. Yeah. I just can't. And that's all I could have been right, talking right. about. Um, but yeah, now I can talk about other things. Anyway, your your version of <laughs> thank Fabata you so was much. Beautiful. Do, do you thank remember you. that? Pega? I do, I do. It was actually one thank of the ones you. I very much enjoyed. Yeah. Thank I, you. I don't think you you, you, never, <laughs> you never heard that, but I did just hear say, it. I don't think you would know at all what we're talking about. <laughs> Not at all. I'm uh, just saying. Uh, that. Um, welcome to Canada. Thank you. Uh, what are your first impressions of uh, now? By the way, you've come to Toronto, yes, which is the hotbed of the epicenter of the Persian diaspora yes. now, but. You are staying downtown yes. as somebody of your carriage, a, 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 a hip person. You, know, <laughs> you don't want to hang out with the Iranians. So you, you, I, I'm actually curious whether you've uh, spent any time in the Iranian in Tehran yet. Have you gone up to the? I, where they I did. I, I went. First of all, I'm here for work. I'm mm. not here just to have fun. If I were here to have fun, I don't think I would be able to afford having <laughs> a, having a right. flat in downtown. Right, it's an expensive um, city. Exactly. So I'm not that much that pretentious. I, I pretend to be pretentious, um, but yes, I went. I went up north um, for a meeting, and I was talking to my colleague in the car. I was talking about home and missing mm -hmm. Iran and how long it's been since I've been there and my, my colleague was is not Iranian so we were speaking in English and as I was speaking to him I saw that all the signs were in <laughs> Farsi <laughs> yeah. but my brain did not register immediately <laughs> I thought that oh this this kind of goes with what I'm talking about right, I was like right. oh no this is Tehran it's like <laughs> like everything was just like from lawyer to, yeah. to mm -hmm. beauty salon. Crazy, isn't it? And then the first place I ate at, can I 
name places. Well, if you, if, is it sure. a positive thing? It is, if, it if is, so, you yes. can give them a plug. I went, yeah. to, I went to Haida Sandwich oh. okay, because yeah. when I was in Iran, how pretentious this I is was. Uh, yeah, to it's too skiing. late already pretentious yes. yeah, yeah i used to go skiing yeah. and and taking high dust sandwich <laughs> just making it worse know. you know that right <laughs> but then i was going skiing as a poor person right, like we yes, would go course. with a minibus yeah. we would hire you couldn't equipment. afford to ski but you would go yes, exactly of course. Yeah, that's yeah. how pretentious <laughs> we, we had to show that we can't but anyway high that meant a lot to me so that was the first thing that wow. i and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to more Iranian food. Well, you will. You'll be seeing a lot of Toronto and a lot of the Persian community because mm-hmm. you're you're here in your capacity. You work with the network Iran International. Yes, and you are producing some of the coverage that's going to be of this uh, festival, this Tier Gone festival yes. coming up. Yes, yes, right. Yes. So yeah, so I'm here just for that. Like we're we're doing a full coverage of the festival, and I am the producer of. It all now set will be um, I'm inevitably talking about that in the next few mm-hmm. weeks we'll probably have some guests on who will be performing at tier gone but separate from that um, first impressions of Toronto of Canada it's it's nice I like how much space you have for oh. everything for like the streets are wider the cars are wider compared to London yes. compared to London yeah. yes like my m- but like flats of shoe boxes <laughs> there and mine here like this place that is only rented out for you know for corporate things people mm. who need to just go and sleep there mm. it is large like this flat in london would be for like a family of five yeah and your lloyd weber would be living in it <laughs> yeah. so probably it's so, so big yeah <laughs> yes but by the I way how, how about this huh she you know she's a, a persian musician coming and staying in a corporate yeah. giant apartment downtown that's, well that's what i was gonna say you must have a really nice apartment because toronto has some shoe boxes as well really? the reality is if you're living here you can barely afford something that's you know of that size so have you been eating i have been have eating you been eating lot. persian food i've been eating some persian food because yes. you know toronto has a lot of good persian mm-hmm. food restaurants. that's why i'm here really <laughs> <laughs> i don't i'm not joking i mean this is I where know. this is kind of the the place to come for outside of iran Absolutely. i'm told for persian food now I, I say that because as a bit of a segue from last week, because mm-hmm. last week we our episode was uh, called "Is Persian Food Healthy?" Mm-hmm. An, an, an un- unwieldy uh, general title because <laughs> there's so many answers to that. Yeah. But we had a, a panel discussion yes. and a lot of debate and and some disagreement, as we as we saw with our audience who never really came to any uh, unity. There's never no. a unity with the Persians, you know. No. And, and I was, as I said last week, not only do people disagree, nobody changes their mind. <laughs> no. You know? No one's willing to change them. No one can be convinced of anything. No. You know? And it's, you know, you just like try and explain mm-hmm. something. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> like you, uh, you give up. <laughs> like you give up. You're like, oh, you're, you're not smart enough to understand what I'm saying to you. That's why your mind is not changing. With that so. said, Moral Mohammadi, yes. producer, broadcaster, musician, what would you, how would you answer the question? Oh. The skill taste, t- 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 the skill tasting, tasting the <laughs> skill testing question is Persian food healthy? We're going to judge you by your answer, no, by the way. No, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, in short, Pretty sure, yeah. I like, as in, in one word, no, but hmm. I think it is, it makes up for its unhealthiness. For example, our stews, we cook everything to death. I think they lose all nutritional values, like warm and when you cook it for like mm. hours and hours. The herbs have nothing to give you anymore. It's just texture and flavor. But we have that with salads and torshi and, and piaz and, mm. and mostokhiyar. That, like the sides of our food kind of make up for how we destroy the ingredients just to get to flavor. <laughs> Uh, destroy i mean that's an interesting perspective mm-hmm. yeah I, I mean by destroy i mean just the nutritional values yes. we, we turn it into gold it's the delicious they're delicious yeah. mm-hmm. but i think it doesn't give you much but everything around it by the way don't look at pega she's never cooked anything in her life <laughs> here we go just look at me she's i mean this uh, woman is I in mean, her 30s not, I, never, I knew this she, was gonna she, she come she back to me. make a hot dog I'm, a, I'm, yeah. I, I mean i can't really be sure that you've ever cooked either oh no no but i I, I, I mean i don't know i'll because have you over you uh, say you say you're gonna cook but you don't oh, invite oh, us oh you see you know see? Oh, i will i will and i'm happy to cook for you but uh but but it that is where you see because I've spent some time cooking Persian food over the years, I, that's why I don't believe it's healthy. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, strictly to make it tasty, you have to, whether it's oil or frying or butter or whatever, yeah. you know. But my mom, again, she was mm-hmm. she was not happy with me after the last because most of the panelists, the food enthusiasts, right. they were they all had versions of this is why Persian food can be healthy. Right. Even Kalapache, there mm-hmm. was a case made, right? And I, so I felt like I was in the position to, I had to, at the very least, play devil's advocate and kind of, so the whole time I was like, oh, come on, you guys, it's not that. <laughs> and my mom was just like, oh, in Chibud, what are you saying? This is like, How you could know, you? This, it's, <laughs> it's basically just herbs and vegetables and meats. What's, yeah, and it's but cooked organic. to death. Yeah. Cooked to death. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the, yeah, my mom, you know. I mean, it's tasty. It's and and the white rice, everything is. With but you know, white it's rice not. It isn't processed food. That's the thing. That, of it course. isn't processed food. What are and we that, comparing it to? Right. You well, know? if you compare it to KFC, mm-hmm. of course, yeah. anything compared to KFC is is almost anything. Right. Right. Uh, except you know there is a there there is a delicacy in Scotland, the deep fried Mars bars. Mm. Maybe KFC is is yeah. healthier than that, but <laughs> it's it it's amazing. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> CNE had that once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like there's, yeah. That's the Canadian National Exhibition. Mm. Uh, you'll be fully Canadian by the end by of the, the month. With yeah. Will I? Yeah. Yes, okay. I believe so. Uh, by the way, uh, somebody, we did get some mail. At somebody in particular wrote, um, oh, you spent all this time, you can't win, you know. You spent all this time talking about Zan Zani Gazadi and the revolution, and now you're talking about Korma Sabzi. Oh. <laughs> you know? and, uh, <laughs> and I was like, People have been yelling us for uh, yelling at us for months that we were only, only talking about yeah. the revolution, and now that we have like one episode about Persian food, so you know you can't win. But I I think I mean you don't believe that. Do, well, let, me, let me not ask a leading question. Do you believe um, we have some sort of responsibility to only talk about the revolution in Iran? Um, not only no. I think um, it's important to um, remember that. Life goes on. Life is going on. But the fight is not done. Often. The fight is still sure. happening. We think about it. We do everything. If, if there is anything that we can do, we, 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 we are responsible to do that if there is anything I- in our hands to mm. do. But I don't think that that's all. Like, I, I'm not posting anything on my social media mm-hmm. um, that is not related. I'm, I mean, recently I haven't been posting anything. But if I you do... You posted the no, the, the, did, the no yes, campaign a couple weeks yes. ago. Yeah. Um, but I don't feel okay about posting a selfie in an mm. elevator. Mm. But I don't... It's like what I, I did don't, today. No, no, but <laughs> I, wasn't I, don't, I don't yeah. think it's, there's anything wrong with it. Yes, I don't feel yes, like doing yeah, it. Yeah. But people who do it think it's important. That is what we get energy from. Uh, uh, we, we, like, uh, I'll tell you what our philosophy... Because obviously we've had, a con- mm-hmm, we've had mm. conversations about this with the team. And... Because it got to a point where, honestly, people were tuning out. They were just like, yeah. we, don't, we don't want to just hear politics. Yeah. From you. And that's not what Rook was, you know, we weren't, yeah. like, didn't start as a politics show. That said, I do think that there has to be a balance. So mm-hmm. what's that's what we've tried to do from week to week. I mean, we've got the roundup where we talk about things. Sometimes we go back and talk about the, uh, the politics. Sometimes we have guests that are, are specifically talking about the uprising, et cetera. I'm homicide sure will probably be some of that today. Um, and then we balance it with musicians and fun and whatever because it seems like it needs to be a balanced diet mm-hmm. at this point. Um, and I, I, I take... Uh, I have some difficulty with those who, you know, all of us, I mean, look, people have to do what they have to do and everybody's mm-hmm. got their own individual anxieties and whatever. So who knows why people make these d- decisions, but there are folks who were going a hundred percent with the revolution and then suddenly stopped and it was all selfies and yeah. fashion photos and you know what, and that, that does feel a little weird to me. You know, I, I, again, maybe people have their reasons, but I think for us trying to find that balance of, mm-hmm. okay, Let's let's respect what's going on, but realize that every podcast, every week, every conversation doesn't need to be that. In fact, kind of somehow neuters the con- news, you know, makes it less less interesting or important because we're just repeating the same things over and over again when there isn't a lot going on. Mm. Uh, and part of it is just angst that we're yeah. repeating, that we're sad and we're angry and we're frustrated and here's what happened, uh, mm-hmm. you know. So it's the balance that we're yeah, looking for. I, I definitely agree. And I think the form of the fight in Iran has also changed. Mm-hmm. Yes. There's another reason that we cannot 
carry on as we were either. Like, it's not people in the street being shot every day. There's a different kind of fight. It is, you know, women being going in the streets without without headscarves, men not go uh, uh, go doing events because women are not allowed. You know, th it is the form and that that type of the um, resistance has changed yes. and we cannot carry on being like in an emergency yes. state that we were the first six mm -hmm. months yes. so I think it's I, I don't I don't think that we have like we can't do that mm. There's, the, the balance is what is required now we can share our ideas we yeah. can share our ideas on social media and uh, are either of you on threads yet? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, but I've been reading some really interesting stuff about threads. Do you know that I joined? I, I, I'm on threads. Yeah. I, I don't, well, that's a thing to say now. I guess. Ricky Gervais just said, I'm on threads. <laughs> you know, I don't know what that, you know, that meant nothing three days three ago. Three days ago, yeah. Now exactly. it's, I'm on threads. Because uh, well, this is Thursday early evening that we're recording this. And uh, so I guess yesterday, mm -hmm. yesterday was when it launched. This is Mark Zuckerberg. This is Meta, Meta. Yeah. Meta's version of Twitter in the smackdown between Musk and Zuckerberg, uh, which none of which I could care about. Um, but I, I have, I, I must say, uh, in recent years, grown a great distaste for Twitter. Mm -hmm. I, it definitely has its facility. I lurk and get some news from there and sports stuff. But I do find it. It is predominantly a, a toxic kind of place where people just attack each other. <laughs> Not that other social media platforms aren't that right. way, but it seems lesser so in places like Instagram, you know. Um, and so I'm hoping that threads will be... People <laughs> to, will turn over first a First of all, I get used to the <laughs> stupid name, but I, I hope, hopefully it'll get, yeah, it'll somehow be a fresh start. Uh, because... Twitter with the big dogging with Elon Musk and everything, everything seems to have gotten, uh, it's just one big rage machine, you know? And, mm -hmm. and uh, the idea of being able to have these conversations through threads uh, mm -hmm. is a great idea. So uh, I know that Twitter lovers will, will be making the case that Mark Zuckerberg has stolen everything from Twitter and just re replaced it, which mm -hmm. he has basically. But I'm, I'm interested. So I'm giving it a go. I'm on... Uh, Threads. You're on threads. Yeah, well, I got a few hundred followers. I started and I was like followers right away, and I was like, oh, I'm back on so you know. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what to, it may be. It may you know, maybe like Clubhouse. You know, maybe like just yeah, something that died that, down. I haven't oh seen but, like first of all, it was awful. First of all, it died for everyone except for Iranians, <laughs> right? Like, oh, are they still are Iranians still? still on? But I think I don't know if now, but I think for Iranians stayed for another oh, okay. few months, and I think there was actually a reason because. There are a few platforms that Iranians can have the, that sort of inside Iran that sort mm -hmm. of live communication with. So it had a it had a reason it had a for for being. Right. But yeah, Clubhouse is it's it's like talking about the I, I don't know it's like talking about the uh, you know beta tapes or like <laughs> you know like the cassette tape or something. Now it's like it's so yesterday. It seems so long ago. Yeah. yeah. And it really came and and zoomed up and then well, you know, I think it was just because of timing like it was during COVID and you know everyone was stuck at home so what else were you going to do yeah and everyone start, w was starting podcasts during COVID exactly right. um, and, and that was just like a immediate kind of a podcasty thing mm -hmm. platform that you could have it was very much like that right um, but yeah it did it, it was terrible it was it terrible was because really the, because you, the, yeah the, you couldn't I mean the conversations were you know, there. Uh, it sounds self-serving to say this as bro broadcaster, you know, but but broadcasting is actually a thing. You know, you have to to it be able to talk and job. to be able to interview, mm -hmm. and people have trained for it, and people have practiced, and people have experience, and so the idea that you can just throw a bunch of people talking in a quote unquote clubhouse mm -hmm. and for that to be interesting was borne out to be not true. Mm -hmm. Some of those sessions were great, but, right? Yeah. Well, going back to threads, yes. um, Elon Musk is apparently... My, my platform. Your platform now. Uh, <laughs> As of like three hours ago, yeah. yeah. <laughs> With your how many followers yeah, so far? Uh, uh, none, um, 500, yeah. <laughs> so Elon Musk is suing Mark Zuckerberg over threads. Is that this, a, I heard something about yeah, that. This, yeah, I mean, within hours of threads yeah. coming out or becoming a platform or whatever else. How do you know just, that threads is a threat? Yeah, yeah, it's being sued. I mean, yeah. Yeah, this is clearly well, he's, touching a nerve. I mean, his his whole stance is that it's a copy of Twitter and that for months Meta has been um, basically finding Twitter employees and, and bringing them over oh. and asking them for trade secrets of Twitter and all of this. 
Um, so that's that's definitely well, it's a hundred percent a copy of. <laughs> it <laughs> is right. No, one, no one's going to say it's not. Yeah, yeah. but I, uh, I, I mean, you wouldn't have. Uh, I was going to use a band reference, but you would not. No I was going to say you wouldn't have Stone Temple Pilots then, because they were just a copy of Pearl Jam. But that's that means nineties rock. Me? That okay. means nothing to you too. <laughs> oh. Nothing. But that um, means please, to me, but somebody still, who understands nineties like, rock, uh, no. who is a child and anybody who was alive in the nineties. When were you even born? Eighty-eight. Okay, so you were alive. Yeah, but, but, I, but yeah, nothing. First of all, you were listening to like Abby or something. Yeah, that's exactly Despite it. Despite being in Canada. That's right. Yeah. I, grew I love up your Ebby. presumptions. I love that, you know, you're saying that, you know, if, if you were not listening to Pearl Jam, you were listening to <laughs> oh, Abby, no, but, right? But this one, no, you she know. was. No, yeah, I, I really was. I, I really she was. was. She was. She <laughs> was. <laughs> she was. <laughs> and you were steeped in classical music, so you know. No, that, uh, that is the, a the presumption? time yeah. that, yes, that is a presumption. I was listening to metal more than anything because I have a brother who's five years older than me and he was into metal and I was into anything that he liked so I listened to Metallica and Megadeth and Death and mm. all of that at that age should I explain the, the reference the Pearl Jam should I explain it or no sure it, I mean I don't know how I much mean, of that I'll get it's but, like you know. telling so, a joke and so explaining in the, no no it's not really know. because it's not so in the early 90s uh -huh. Uh, a new form of music called grunge emerged out of Seattle, mm -hmm. the forerunners being Nirvana, of course. And then there's a band called Pearl Jam, mm -hmm. led by Eddie Vedder, who was in low voice, you know, and, and it was grungy. Oh, I'm still alive. And then uh, a bunch of bands came out that, and one of them being Stone Temple Pilots, great band, by the way, mm -hmm. sounded exactly like Pearl Jam. Like, I thought it was a joke at first. I was like, oh, is this a... And then people were like, no, Stone Temple Pilots. And so, yeah. So, my, so the career of Stone the Temple Pilots... The blank stare is oh, here. It's just a disaster. <laughs> I told can you, we, don't can, explain. Sound I person Louise, you. please edit this. No, anyway, so yeah. Uh, okay, the point is, there's a lot of things that are copied right, in the world. Right, right. Bob Dylan copied Hank Aaron. A bunch of people copy Bob Dylan. I feel like Dylan. you're just selling threads because you're on it now and it's like... I have no allegiance <laughs> to threads. I don't even know if... I'll, I'll probably go off it later you tonight. You can't. You know that, right? If you delete, Once you're in threads, no, you have no, to No, no, no. So if you... Because it's joint to your Instagram, if you delete your threads, you delete your Instagram. What? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. Yep. They got you. They got you. Oh. Yeah. They got me. Yep. Well, maybe I'll delete my Instagram. I mean, come on. Okay. Look at look at Morale running around with her, you know, apartments and stuff. She doesn't need this <laughs> stuff. Are you on you're on Instagram? Yeah. You follow me. I do, yeah. But are you gonna, I mean you can you can are try you gonna, and act cool. Are you gonna go on threads? You don't, no, I don't <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I mean, if it's gonna be impossible to get rid of I mean, I was interested to see what like because I saw a few people say, mm -hmm. No, I'm on threads now. I want to go and see what it is, yeah. but no. They're all impossible. I mean, isn't it isn't that the Facebook thing that you could never go off Facebook? Remember well, that thing where yeah, you, see, you can never delete your Facebook? That's the thing. I remember because I deleted my Facebook like 10 years ago mm. now, I think it is. And even though I've deleted it, every so often there's an email that comes from Facebook saying, oh, did you want to reopen your Facebook? And I'm like, how is this possible? Yeah, I've deleted right. this it's still 10 there. years ago. It's still there. And yet, it will you know, haunt you. Ugh, yeah. It will. We are coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms. We're on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Instagram, CastBox, if you want to see visuals with what you're hearing on Rook, you can switch over to YouTube. There's full interviews, say, with uh, Bijan Mortezavi. We'll have um, some of the Homer Sachar interview up as soon as we can on YouTube. That's at Rook Media. Uh, if you want to watch it, that is. And if you like your descriptions and bulletins associated with Rook, both in English and in Persian, you can join us on Telegram. Remember to support us. Go to our website, rookmedia.com, R-O-Q-E media.com. Press the support us button and you, you can become a Patreon member, a Rook member on Patreon, that is, for a few bucks a month. It really helps us. If you are a regular uh, member of our audience and you haven't done this yet, we really appreciate it if you become a Rook member. And uh, that's how we crowdsource. That's how we stay alive. So, okay. Pega Moral. Let's get to the Rook Roundup before we get to Homo Sashar. Uh, Pega, what do we have in the roundup today? A um, couple of local um, events that took place. Yesterday was the uh, PS752 Forum on Justice. So that took place locally here in Toronto. Um, and then it was followed by a rally at Mel Asman Square. So um, this was 
quite emotional actually i saw some videos um of the rally and of the forum and i was just you know so much time has passed by since the downing of ps752 and yet seeing these videos it almost felt like i was right back to right. when the incident took place so i was really moved by some of the videos um the forum of course highlighted um uh, the fact that the four countries, Canada, Ukraine, United Kingdom, and Sweden, have referred the case um, to the International Court of Justice. Um, there was a lot of reiteration of where the association stands and what they would like. Um, and of course, again, locally asking the Canadian government to designate um, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organization. Yeah. So it felt like yesterday was a big step forward in the legal process mm -hmm. against Iran. Uh, against the regime when it comes to the accountability for PS752, right? Yeah, I mean, the fact that, you know, this is moving towards um, and actually taking place and going to the International Court of Justice is in and of itself such a big step. Mm. Um, and the fact that they're actually reviewing the case now is, is I think, the biggest thing to have happen to the, the association and, and the ask that they've had since day one. It really was a turning point, mm, that the, yeah. the, the downing of... PS752 and it and it, you're right it's it's impossible to not get I mean you just can't yeah. steep yourself in it every day but it's impossible not to get moved and emotional mm -hmm. when you think about that that moment and the, and the the calls for justice are so legitimate Absolutely Um what else you got um, next, we have the UN fact-finding mission on Iran. So this was, I mean, months back now, there mm. was this... Um, the thing that we said is going to take months. And, exactly, yeah, which yeah, it has yeah, now yeah. taken mm -hmm. months. Great. And funny enough, yeah. it's going to take more even months. more months. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll get to that, actually. But um, they... <laughs> maybe, maybe they should go on threads. You know, it's getting should. a lot of attention. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> the, yeah. it, it, might, uh, it might move at a faster pace if they <laughs> right, did. Right, right. But um, so they had, I guess, their first meeting um, to report on what it is that they've been doing over the course of these months. Mm. Um, and so here's the pessimistic side of me coming out again. I was really disappointed. I mean, I was With this meeting. Yeah, no. I was supremely disappointed because and not to make fun of this whole month situation, but really we've been waiting all this time for them to come back with something. Right. And the things that they came back with, I mean, ask any Iranian and they could already tell you all of these things. They sat there and, and again, I, not all of it was this, but let me uh. just, you know, continue with what I'm saying. They sat there and who, basically... Who sat there? This is the... So this is the mission. So this uh, is the UN fact-finding mission, mission, which was... Uh, a reporting to of, the United Nations. Reporting to okay. the United Nations, and it's composed of a couple of people that the UN put together. So if you remember months back, they... Yes. they there was even some controversy this. about who those people absolutely, were. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So now their report, quote-unquote, is basically saying that, you know, we're calling for the release of... Um, uh, detainees and you know we're worried about facial recognition that the Islamic Republic is going to use we're worried about potential new laws that are going to impose harsher punishments on these individuals uh, and oh yeah let us tell you that although you're not really seeing protests in the news as much the Islamic Republic is still doing things that are horrible <laughs> well gee thanks like you know as if we didn't already know this and then the part that really really upset me is that to end things, they said, oh, we'll give you a full report in March of 2024. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean. A year. Another yeah, year. Yeah. Exactly. And so I just. Way past the, the way past the anniversary of, of when everything started. That's right. Oh, yeah. And they also didn't, um, like, there were a lot of interruptions when people were saying regime and and like for example different different um speakers the different speakers were saying that th no that this is this is a wrong term this is not a polite oh you're term not allowed to, to use the word regime yes uh. but they were they kept interrupting the speeches because wow. they wanted to like break the flow of whatever was ha mm -hmm. whatever that was happening and it was kind of a teamed up bullying towards anybody th who was speaking and a lot of people were not given floor to to make sure that they don't say the things that, like even UN yeah. had part mm -hmm. in in choosing who is or isn't allowed to speak. It seems like we're seeing a lot of that at the UN recently. Yep. I mean where you know certain speakers aren't allowed to talk and they're they're limiting individuals and in what they can the, the and cannot say. The whole thing is uh, sorry to cut you off. No, it's okay. The whole thing is such a catch 22 mm -hmm. because from the get go, I mean from you know October people were saying fuck the UN. They don't right. there's the, this it's a it's a it's that this body is not going to do anything. It's not going to really help the people of Iran. There's no, it, it, you know, it's, it's too murky and, and it doesn't, and there's all kinds of politics behind it and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Ineffective. On the other hand, 
you, you know, it's the one international body, one mm-hmm. of the international bodies we have. You have people like Aza de Rojan, who's working hard all the time with the Swedish MP we had on the show, talking about, look, you got to move the goalposts with the UN, at mm-hmm. least let's get, you know. So we're caught, right? We need the UN somehow. Yeah. We know it's ineffective at the same time. Then when it's ineffective, we get frustrated. We, we put our hopes in something like a fact-finding mission that goes nowhere. The thing yeah. is, it's not, it's not only that they're ineffective. They, are, they, they sometimes do things that are against the people. Like when they, when they uh, uh, make the Islamic Republic the chair of mm-hmm. the, the, the women's right. You know, when they do things like this, you kind of reminded that they're not with you. They're, no. they're, they're mm-hmm. Whatever is happening behind the curtains are not things that you think. And yes, they are one of the only, uh, one of the few um, international bodies that you can kind of rely on. Uh, so mm-hmm. we, you know, we, we, we try to... Desperately uh, seek, help. seek help. Right. Yeah. <laughs> this is the same kind of thing that we thought when we were, I don't know, voting for Musavi, that, you know, among all of them, he's at least a little bit better. He's mm. the only hope that we could have. But it is still, he's, it, it, it's, it's shit. Th- it's the same with UN, that yes, it is the only option that we have, but that doesn't mean that it is any good. Yeah. It, it, mm-hmm. it, a lot of, and um, definitely there are people working in UN, there are who, speaker, are, great. who are amazing, yeah. Yeah. but the system is not there for those people to be able to uh, um, achieve things. It is wow. for those people to kind of occasionally make us happy, say something that was like, oh, someone in the UN said this, I'm going to get excited about it. But the UN itself is not there for the people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, we, we count as, we can't, uh, you don't want to, you don't want to sort of trivialize or dump on small victories that we've had. Mm-hmm. Remember how we all celebrated when Iran got kicked out of the, yeah what was it, the status of women UN kind of committee or something like that. Yeah, and they chaired something else. And then they end up chairing the, U, U, the, the Human one. Rights Committee. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's a just, joke. That's a thing. The it's whole a thing joke. is, yeah, it's but really... But I think, I think it keeps going back to, you know, what Marl mentioned just now and what we've talked about over the course of the past few months is we have this such, such a deep sense of hopelessness that every so often we try to grasp onto something, something that, you know, will give us that little bit of hope to think, okay, you know what, we're doing something or an international body is doing something something or Mm. a government is doing something or you know a coalition is doing something it's like we just want that little bit of hope so that we can continue this fight and it's so hard to to stay in that hopelessness and to keep feeling like there's by the the way when when we say i'm assuming you mean when we say continue this fight we're talking about how we can this has to be about the people inside iran yes yeah it's all about what the people inside Iran want and of can course, do and course. how we can support them. Mm-hmm. So it's not about the UN or anybody else coming and trying to take over what, you know, or, oh, or, or, you know, move mountains. It's, it's how do we, uh, if, if not support the people inside Iran and their will mm-hmm. not enable the people that everyone exactly. in Iran mm-hmm. seems to not want as their, as their governing body. Right. So, yeah. uh, okay. What else you got? Enough about the UN. Yes. Enough about the UN. Um, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about too much Salehi. So I know this is someone that we've talked about for months and unfortunately not a lot has changed. But yesterday there was a lot of um, reports that really started to go viral uh, about whether or not he was going to be given a prison sentence or, you know, there was something that was happening behind closed doors and there was a lot of confusion. This is the dissident Iranian rapper, mm-hmm. too much Salehi, who has basically been in imprisoned but also probably in solitary, solitary. solitary for yeah. months right that's right and no one's heard from him nothing right? so been, we've all yeah okay yeah Go there's ahead. been very very little so yesterday and i don't know exactly what sparked this or you know unfortunately we've we've talked about this how there's such lack of real true information that we can really verify and and believe but there were some reports of the fact that there was some closed door uh conversations that were had and there were a, there was a potential prison sentence that was going to be issued to him so this came out and of course on twitter not threads mm-hmm. uh, there was a lot of conversation about you know we should be happy because he's not going to be executed they weren't giving him a death sentence and a lot of divided opinions about what this meant then a couple hours later one of his lawyers actually um made a statement and said no this was false and no decision has actually come out yet there's been nothing reached and we're still right back where we were so lots of confusion about too much Salehi but definitely wanted to mention him because I mean it's just incredibly awful the fact that he's been in solitary all this time and yep. yeah yeah okay. there are some um, 
mm, discussions that I saw on social media, which I agree with, mm -hmm. is that there's nothing other than him coming out of prison unharmed with a big apology is a thing that we should be happy mm -hmm. about. It is, yes, we, 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 it is a relief that they haven't given an immediate death sentence right. like they have done many times recently. And we all have that fear for him and everybody else that is in prison. But it's not something to be all happy and se it's not a celebration. Mm -hmm. yeah. The only thing that we can celebrate if is if he comes out unharmed. Yes. Um, and we cannot settle for anything less than mm -hmm. that because he hasn't done anything. There's not, but that doesn't mean anything in this regime. Well, of course. They, they there's executed protesters people, have been executed. Yeah, yes, also, executed yeah. because they burned a bin. That's so right. it's, it's not a thing that we can expect from this regime. But really, we should. We right. should. It's not something to celebrate. Sorry, mm -hmm. can you not use the word regime when you're talking? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so <laughs> sorry. Yes, what what, what yes. word? What, what word did they require, by the way? Government or something? Uh, yes, the uh, government. Government. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was government. Um, I did want to end off on a happier note. Okay. Um, there was some. There Is was it a about threads. No, <laughs> it's not. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there was a feel good story that I wanted to share, right. uh, and I actually posted this on on my Instagram too because I I loved it. Um, Noza, and I'm gonna butcher her name, so I apologize. But Nozanin Zagari Ratcliffe. Zagari. Zagari. See, yeah. I knew I was gonna get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thank she, God, Moral is here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. She's for my home girl, you know. <laughs> Perfect. See, who better to correct me then? Um, so there was a story about um, about her, and now she was detained back in 2016. She served, I think, six years um, in prison in Iran. I mean, I won't even get into why she was imprisoned. Again, it's one of those sham trials and crazy stories of why she was imprisoned, but. Anyhow, over the course of the six years that she was in prison, uh, while she was in solitary, one of the years, the one thing that kept her going was watching Wimbledon. And so during her solitary confinement, she, you know, sat down and watched these tournaments. And one of her, I guess, favorite players was Andy Murray, who won in 2016. And the so Brit. she... The Brit. The yeah. Brit, exactly. So she vowed to tell this story if and when she came out of prison. Mm. And of course she did. And she shared this story and somehow this story got to him. And so recently... I think a couple of days ago, if I'm not mistaken, she was invited to sit in his box, I guess, to watch him play alongside. Um, she sat with Roger Federer and the Princess of Wales to watch Andy Murray mm. win once mm. again. And so this was just such a feel good story. And, you know, we've been seeing so many unfortunate stories coming out of Iran and talking about imprisonments and things like this. And like you said, to have someone come out of a prison like that, you know, unharmed thankfully and to then see them in a situation like this it just feel good story for sure okay this is like initially when i saw I, I only saw like a video of her being mm -hmm. watching uh, wimbledon which is great you know yeah. it's it's good seeing her anywhere i think is a great thing mm -hmm. but when i saw just the thumbnail I, it was so like unimportant to me. it looked so unimportant mm -hmm. that i didn't even click to see the rest of it i was like it is why i mean yes great great i'm so happy that she's out and she could come to wimbledon but why is this news but now that you told the backstory mm -hmm. mm. i i see what like i it, it is very sweet and yeah. it is it's hopeful it is that thing that's that exactly we need. It. it is the thing that we need that things can change mm -hmm. things things will change it it will take time it it like it might not look like it is possible right now but things will change mm -hmm. um but yeah this it is a sweet it is it is very sweet it did it, i don't know when i when i saw that and i saw the posts and and the story and i was reading it it, it really touched me i just thought you know it, it is that hope that mm. it's exactly what it is thank you thank you uh thanks for that uh pega and moral what a pleasure it is to have you, really. Thank uh, you. All joking aside now, it's <laughs> <laughs> which is difficult for me. <laughs> so to look at you and not say something about you being a hipster and <laughs> not wanting us, uh, not being interested in being our friends. Uh, it, it is really great to have you in Toronto. Right, so I look so forward to, to uh, giving you a proper tour of the city yes. uh, and um, and... 
uh, bringing a uh, hundred people into your massive apartment that you have <laughs> 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 and then sharing the photos on threads. Um, <laughs> thank you, Moral. Thank you, Pega. Thank you. Let's thank you. get to our feature guests. My feature guest today is an award-winning Iranian-American journalist, author, and women's rights activist who has dedicated over five decades to creating content, reporting, conducting interviews, and providing information to Iranians. Homa Sarshar was born in Shiraz in 1946. She was raised in Tehran with a background in French literature. Homa pursued her passion for journalism and obtained her PhD in the field from the American World University in the United States. Before the revolution of 1979, she worked as a columnist for Zaniruz magazine and the Kahan Daily Newspaper from 1964 to 1978. During that time, she also served as a television producer, a director, and a talk show host for national Iranian radio and television. In 1978, Homa was effectively forced into exile with the coming of the Islamic Republic, and she moved to the U.S., where she continued her work as a freelance journalist, radio and television producer, and on-air host. In 2005, Homa founded the Center for Iranian Creative Arts, a nonprofit organization based in Los Angeles. She also served as a trusted advisor to Human Rights Watch for 25 years. Her expertise and dedication have earned her multiple awards awards and recognition. In fact, just last week, she was awarded the 13th Bita Prize for Persian Arts at a ceremony at Stanford University. And right now, Homa Sarshar joins me from Los Angeles today. Hello. Thank you, Jian. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to your program. It's an honor. It's a great pleasure to have you back on. And it's it, believe it or not, it's been three years, almost uh, exactly three years since the last time you were on this program. You you just received this beta prize. I'm going to obviously ask you about the community, about the uprising, all kinds of things that have happened in the three years since our last interview. But, but let's start with your award from last week. You received this beta prize for Persian arts at Stanford University. Congratulations. What, uh, what did it mean to you? Thank you very much. It meant a lot because, uh, that was the first time that, uh, they, uh, assigned it an award to a journalist and uh, they gave a recognition to our profession, mine and yours. Um, let us say that back in Iran, before the revolution, journalists didn't have that much of respect or their stand was not very respectful, uh, except few. But uh, after the revolution also, it was the same uh, until uh, this uh, recent uprising that we saw why and how these uh, journalists, especially Iranian journalists, women have done for this uprising, so to reporting, to uh, fact finding and all the, all the activity that they needed to do to let the world know what's going on in Iran. So uh, on that point, I think uh, that uh, just giving uh, uh, an award to a journalist from a very respectful university and also to the Iranian Studies Department of uh, Stanford University it means a lot to every single of us that have been in this uh, profession for many years, for me, for six decades, almost six decades. And uh, I accepted the award on behalf of the all Iranian women and all Iranian journalists, and I'm glad that to uh, just be a representative of uh, our profession at Stanford University. Well, the award is so well deserved. Your your work has been. You've always strived for excellence. You've always strived for honesty. You've been a pioneer. You've been a groundbreaker. But you've also sort of been tireless. I mean, you you seemingly at least have never taken a break over the years. The last couple of years, uh, you stepped away from your legendary weekly radio program that you had in Los Angeles. And I've been thinking about you. I mean, I, I follow you on sh social media, so I know that you haven't been a shrinking violet. You've been continuing to, to work hard. But tell me what it's been like for you to not have that regular gig that you had for so long. Uh, um, Gian, I thought that at the, on March, two years ago in March, I thought that uh, I have done my share of the... Um, television, radio, and print journalism uh, on a regular basis and uh, on a 
programs that were weekly programs or daily programs. Uh, so it was almost 55 years, 56 years after I started back in Iran. And I thought I'm on an age or on a position that I should just step back a little bit from regular programming and do whatever is uh, close to my heart, meaning just pay more attention to what's going around and be like host in different guests in different television or radio programs and to write uh, because I was writing for 57 years and my uh, memoirs that which was out 30 years ago and since that two volume book was out I uh, just wrote and put it aside wrote and put it aside and I didn't think that um, I would go and to write another book or to print another book but uh, because I was very busy doing my job so these two years gave me that uh, time that I needed and also um, the happening of COVID and this pandemic that yeah. put everybody, single of us at home, uh, just gave me the opportunity to sit down and, and put uh, my second volume of uh, memoirs, which titled Ravayat Mandegari or the, a narrative of perseverance. In that way, I thought that these books um, would tell everybody what I've done and what I've seen when what we have done as a Iranian in diaspora, because these are mostly my daily or weekly uh, memoirs. All uh, the, my writings, you can you can see the community, Iranian community in uh, California, especially in Los Angeles, what they were doing and. Uh, the researcher, the students who, who want to work on mm. Iranian diaspora or in the future uh, should have a referral, a book that can go, they can go to and, and find by date, by time, by names, what happened to Iranian diaspora during the last 30 years. So the 10 first years was in Darkuche uh, Paskuchoy Gorbat, and the second part is the 30 years after. And uh, this was something that I uh, thought about it very much, but uh, by just retiring from a regular program, give me the opportunity and time to do it. And uh, besides that, I just gave all my archive, I donated all my archive to Stanford University, the um, Library of uh, Standard University, the Department of Iranian Studies, and they have everything that I gathered mm. during that 40 years, which is print, voice, uh, videos, everything that has been digitized by myself. So I thought this would be like a final chapter of this archive to put everything together and to give a perspective of our life and diaspora. And I have also assigned a scholarship for a student who wants to do uh, research on Iranian uh, in diaspora and use all this archive that they donated to Stanford. But, but see, you, <laughs> it was called retirement, but you've just let, given me a list of things you're doing. I mean, is it fair to say you're not very good at just putting up your feet and doing nothing? Doing nothing, I I don't remember any day in my life that I've done anything. And actually, one of my uh, neighbors, an American lady, uh, one day was talking to me and said, did you ever sat by pool and just do nothing? And I said, yeah, sometimes I sat by the pool and I read a book. And she said, no, not even read a book, do nothing. And for that question, I remember that I answered, no, I don't remember not doing anything. This is not the nature. But can I also say, I mean, and I think it's important to point out that uh, working as a journalist, particularly in the Iranian space uh, and in the diaspora. Is it also fair to say over the last four decades, since you've been doing this in the U.S. at least, um, you wouldn't have been doing this for the money? No, never. Uh, I, I was a journalist, a paid journalist back in Iran. This was very uh, natural. But since the revolution happened, I know that the journalism and people who work who, who try to have a TV program, radio program, uh, a print magazines, you newspapers or, uh, or anything, they're just very, very tight on their budget because there is no uh, government support. We were back in Iran 
were used to work for the uh, Iranian National Radio and Television, which was a government uh, uh, organization. So here there was nothing. People who loved their profession and wanted to continue what they were doing didn't have that much money. So uh, since for that last the time, and now it's 44 years that we're here in the United States, I have been working just for my own satisfaction and voluntary if you want to call it or just didn't ask for any money back see i've heard you say this uh homajan that you've worked for 40 years in the u.s and never made a dime and and you said you're proud of this and i think you meant in the sense that you're you're comfortable with volunteering doing what you can for the sake of the iranian community and the iranian people but uh isn't this the point uh, isn't this the problem i mean uh, w- with the way uh, the iranian community approaches something like culture and arts um that you should have been paid i mean that that journalism should be valued that these media jobs should be seen as something that is valuable to the community i don't think that i, I wouldn't expect to be interviewing a legendary dentist or a legendary builder or a legendary you know astronaut on this program and have them say well i've never been paid a dime over the last 40 years that's part of the problem with our community isn't it exactly you're a hundred percent right and you echo my uh, son woman uh, because he just keep telling me mom uh, you have a, a saying in our you in your language that is in rome you should work you should act like roman you're in the united states you're working and you should be paid you're going uh, giving speeches and lectures um, from here to europe and you pay for your plane your airplane you for your flight you pay for your a uh, hotel and you you just uh, do the best and you deliver what they are asking you and you never ask for money and i said this is uh, this is something that i cannot do anything about it because it's like the culture that i have been raised with and but recently uh, i i see that few organizations and few televisions like uh, that have been started working maybe a few years or since a few years ago and they are just backed by governments and uh, uh, different governments and they are working uh, very professionally they are asking they're giving that option to you that we pay for your hotel and we pay for your flight that i accept it <laughs> but uh, besides that um, i think that my generation needs to be as as realistic as your generation is to um, to know that working for um, and not getting paid for it is not is not correct. Yeah, yeah. For me, it's a little late, Jianjian. I would I, I really would have appreciated if you also would give me that advice thirty years ago, <laughs> so I would think about it and change my attitude. But this is what is expected from us, and I just. I just went with it. I I do think it's a I do think it's somehow a part of the cultural DNA that uh, that Iranians based on you know patterns of behavior in Iran, especially over the last few decades that uh, have been migrated here. So that I mean, how many festivals have you seen organized where they say, well, the musicians will play for free? They're, they'll enjoy having a stage, and you say, well, that's a job. You know, uh, being a journalist is a job. Being a, a cultural curator is a job. So I think that's that's part of an ongoing struggle. And of course, you you're living not too far from someone like Farid Zoland, who's who had he been the legendary songwriter that he is in English music he would be a billionaire at this point for the the hits he's written instead he's living in a small place modestly and collecting no royalties that's that's something that we have to fix yes the younger generation will do that the second or third generation of Iranian will will know what how to do it and will they will do that and i'm 100 percent with you 100 percent. let me segue from what you've been doing to the last in the last two or three years to to well part of what you've been doing which is over the last 10 months which is responding to what's been happening in iran as you get called upon to to give us perspective and to do interviews etc uh, i, I want to ask you about the uprising we we have witnessed over the last 10 months in iran first of all uh, let's start from the start were you surprised um not not by the fact that there was another uprising in Iran. We've seen this pattern now over and over again and with shorter intervals in between each one. But were you surprised by the sheer strength of it, the determination of the young women 
uh, and the young men who led this new round of protests, this ongoing revolution against the regime. I was surprised seeing the generation 80s and 90s, as I say, they said in Iran, I mean, younger teenagers and younger generation on the street and how they how they persevered uh, on what they wanted, how they were, uh, their act was heroic on my uh, view and uh, how uh, they they were not scared of uh, being shot or being dead. But this is not something to applause, but because you need this hero to be alive. Mm-hmm. But I was every single day uh, since this uh, uprising happened, this revolution, um, I find something new in the, in this generation that I didn't know I was not familiar with. And I, I'm in awe that uh, uh, for what they have done, uh, a revolution led by women, and this is the first revolution in the history, and young women, and revolution that is led by women and supported by men. This is also a very unique by itself. A revolution that is includes younger generation, and uh, that is also unheard of. A generation that is supported, those younger generation are supported by their parents. Normally the parents are scared and they don't want their kids and their younger generation, younger son or daughter go to the street when they know that they are just facing uh, death or facing, facing uh, 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 accident that is brutal uh, by this regime. Mm. But we see parents in, uh, encouraging their uh, their kids to go and they, they join them, they support them. So every single point of this revolution, this uprising and this movement was surprising to me. Mm. And uh, I was very positive at the beginning. I was very excited. I just, there was nights that I wouldn't sleep and just following what's going on in Iran and giving voice to the voice of uh, Iranian demonstrators and do whatever I can to go to United, uh, United Nations, go to government people whom I know and talking to them, uh, asking them for uh, help, for support. Uh, this was almost 10 months of nonstop hmm. work in supporting this uprising. When, when you, I, when, sorry, when you say every day you would learn something new that amazed you about these young people in it, can, can you give, me an, give, give us an example of that? What comes to mind when you say something that Homosar Shah would have learned from what these young people are doing in Iran? When uh, they shot some young people, to, to, to Mahsa, Nika, Sarina, their friends and the, their family would, would come and talk about, this is not the end, we have lost a child, but we're going to continue. We are the one that we're going to get the revenge of our, uh, mm-hmm. the, the, that killing. And that was, that was something that uh, stayed in my mind very vividly. When I saw this young uh, chef, handsome man who just wanted to have the right to leave the right to do his job the, yeah. to be the best and, and the, the, this young Iranian woman the, the uh, Mahsa who came to Tehran just to visit and to to be able to see a, a, a city besides his own and spend some vacation there and this happened and you see the family of these uh, victims how they react and when you see um, when they arrest this uh, uh, demonstrator and protester and they put them in jail, what they do in the jail mm-hmm. and when they leave them, they just free them from the jail. They start again. So does that defiance feel new? Very new to me, because I I believe that in the past, uh, the demonstration that we saw, even the green movement, the green movement, when the uh, government started to react uh, brutally and start uh, uh, arresting people or killing people because at that time also people were killed. Uh, very soon and very quickly, people went back to home. Yeah. Not this time. This yeah. time they were there. Now some people that are a little bit of up, not optimistic and they are pessimistic about this uprising and everything they said is done, is finished. 
I, um, I'm telling you, it's not finished. And I, I see that they are just taking a new breath and they just, they want to just reset themselves and come back. And uh, you see every, every single day, you see something happening. Every single day you have on the news, their, their demonstrations and their, uh, their challenges with the government and the government just uh, pulling back. And uh, this, all these signs shows it's not done, it's okay. not finished. Let me come back to that because I want to ask you about where we're at now. But let, let's just stick with the fall for a moment because you talked about the inspiration and the, the learning curve and the amazement about what was happening inside Iran. Uh, talk to me about the diaspora where you've also lived for the last 40 years and the massive outpouring of Iranians around the world taking to the streets we saw in support of the people of Iran in the immediate weeks after Masa I mean, he was killed. The 80,000 here in Toronto, the 100,000 in Berlin, the big rally you probably were at or saw in Los Angeles. Uh, what, what was that like for you as someone who has been basically working in a form of community building through, through media, through journalism um, over the last four decades outside of Iran? That was also surprising because we have done a lot of demonstrations starting from uh, killing of Bakhtiar or 42 years ago. Every time everything happens, we went to uh, the federal building here in Los Angeles and started demonstrating. And the most uh, and the biggest demonstration that we had for that uh, past 40 years, we didn't have more than eight or 9,000 or 10,000 people there and seeing a huge 100,000, 80,000 people coming out. And in that demonstration, you see third generation Iranian in diaspora joining us. Uh, the younger generation who didn't even speak uh, Persian. Yes. Something happened, something happened in, in their heart that they just starting going, becoming coming back to the roots yes. and doing something. I have seen a lot of Iranian young people that connected with us and with me and with my other Iranian journalists or activists, and they needed some some guidance. What we can do? What do you think that we do? Tell us what you can do. We want to do something for, uh, for this uh, movement. And that was also surprising and heartwarming for me to see because uh, sometimes you think Sometimes, sometimes, some days that you're a little bit depressed and think yeah. that nothing happened, you, uh, uh, you think, oh, okay, the, the third generation, a little bit of second generation, but the third generation of Iranian diaspora, for sure they have, they have uh, forgotten their, their origin and their roots, and they are just Americanized. And uh, uh, maybe um, in, in another generation, there would be no... No Iranian TV, no Iranian radio, right, no print right. journalism, no books written in Persian in outside Iran. But by seeing those those a wave of Iranian young young youth in the demonstration, yeah. that gave me a, a relief that no, it's still they think about their roots and they're back to their roots. But with that said, now let's talk about how the mood has changed. And you referenced it a moment ago, although you. You gave us a tip of the hat of where you're going to go with this in terms of the fact that you believe that things are still alive and kicking. But, I mean, the uprising began with a lot of hope and anticipation. And you've pointed out that um, Shervin's now iconic Bad Oye song is an anthem of hope, uh, an ode to freedom. Um, but the tone of the uprising is very different today. 10 months in. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of frustration. There's the perception of a fizzling of a movement and the entrenched dominance again of the regime. Has all the hope that was gained during a very unified for a while autumn been lost? No, the hope is not lost. Maybe uh, trajectory has changed. Uh, when something is new and you're just experiencing some new uh, movement or your new activities, you for sure there would be also some mistakes done. So I think that the, in Iranian, outside Iran, in the Iranian diaspora, uh, some movement that has been done by a uh, few uh, people experienced uh, a backlash. And uh, the unity has been, uh, has been a little bit uh, damaged. Uh, by this and uh, 
maybe it, it, there was a need for for us to know that we are not here to be a leader or to to do the job of leadership here of this movement we are here to support we are here to be to be the voice of the voiceless and just engaging in this kind of activities uh, wouldn't help as you can see the community has been divided after that and uh, that division was not good and it brought a little bit of anger in the community in uh, in Iran and outside Iran and also inside Iran they were very very adamant that we we're going to help them but uh mistake mistake is is done and uh, we can just step back and think where the mistake were and change it and go to the right trajectory uh but it takes time uh, but i believe that um all this time and all these experiences that we had gave us a little bit of knowledge, more knowledge, how to do it, how to help this uh, mm. this movement. And I hope that now that we are talking, the Iranian community outside Iran has reached this consensus that we need to be only a support group mm. for Iranian inside Iran. Right, right, so, right. There would be no leadership chosen from here. There would be no uh, nothing happening or no orders from going or no leader going flying from here to Iran to continue the the, the job or to start a, a, a new uh, government or anything. And everything that we need for Iran in the future, uh, freedom, democracy, anything that is good for them should come from inside Iran and from the Iranian inside Iran. Do you think or, do you think everyone signed on to that in terms of the the people yeah. uh, who are the so-called opposition leaders etc? No, they're just I I'm I'm, I'm sure that uh you're not asking this question for me to answer because you know that that's a fact. No, not everybody uh agree with that, but I think they should they should wake up and they should know and they should bet they should know better that uh, after 40 45 years outside iran we don't even know the name of the street in tehran or anywhere else but we have capacity to help those uh, people inside iran we we have the means to do that the iranian community has money the iranian community has knowledge the iranian community has connection i mean iranian in diaspora and this is what they need to use to help them inside, to let their voice be heard, and to change some uh, uh, Western or free uh, uh, leaders of the free mm -hmm. world to know what they need to do. If they are going wrong, if they are making decisions that are not correct, if they are just uh, dealing with the uh, Islamic Republic government and just giving us some lip service, this is not good. We should just let them know I, I, about it. I do think everybody, I mean, it seems to me, everyone from Hamanis Maliun to Reza Pahlavi to Massey, they, they all seem to be saying self-determination for the people inside Iran. It seems it's the language that they they speak. Um, maybe some of the followers don't necessarily agree with that. Can I can I suggest something that I believe is where, where the... Where the, the, the famous <laughs> or infamous Iranian disunity really emerged was um, out of frustration and anger that there wasn't more happening sooner and quicker. And I wonder if uh, there was a raising of expectations, a bit of a la-la land that happened in the fall that um, people, particularly in the diaspora, um, got got did, I mean did we lose ourselves a little bit in exuberance that the revolution is coming and we're going to be sitting in a cafe in Tehran in a couple of months and 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 there seemed to be a delta between what the people in Orange County or in in Vancouver or in in Sydney were feeling and saying and expecting and what was actually happening in the streets of of Iran what's what's your take on that well when you are just facing this kind of happening and uh, you just go with the mass hysteria because and you're right everybody was so excited and think that that's that's it in a couple of months in a matter of month, months or weeks we're going to just 
uh, this uh, we're going to topple the government and uh, the revolution will happen. But there were there were clever political analysts or people who are have more knowledge about revolution in 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 the world all over. They were just giving us some some guidance that no no this is not happening in a matter of days more than weeks. The revolution had need, needs uh, time and needs its uh, uh, process and you should be very uh, patient with it and uh, go read about the revolution in different countries what happened. Sometimes it takes years uh, to happen, but at that time that you're talking and a few months after it started, everybody was so excited about the change that is coming that they wouldn't listen. Yeah. Uh, I think now uh, we have more ears to listen to what's, uh, what they were telling us yeah. and uh, start everything anew and uh, be more realistic than optimistic for what's going on to Iran. So uh, I believe that the revolution is still doing, is still going on, is still, uh, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. How long it's going to take, I don't know. How it's going to happen, I don't know. But the thing is, we have not lost, I have not lost hope. I was not that, uh, let's say, um, hopeful at the beginning that it's going to happen I, I even had the, the argument with one of my friends that say, oh, we're going to go have this year where they're going to have no rules in Iran and then in the, we're going to go to everywhere. It's, going to, it's not going to happen that, that soon. It, it needs a lot of things to happen. And most that we need to know and that we need to do is to just to talk about these Iranian people, to voice, to, to just have the governments each each person in the, in the country that they're living to bring the government that or the leaders of the, the the country or the people that are influential in in the government to know what's going on to Iran and ask them what they want but nowadays you see uh, that um, some leaders of the free world are not are not doing their job correctly yeah. they are not doing their job ethically uh, because you should be very realistic and know that no leader of a country loves or cares about uh, citizens of other countries than it's her or his own uh, citizen. Yeah. But uh, meanwhile, there are some requests. Uh, there are some things that we can ask them to do it that would be beneficial both for, for their country and for Iranian diaspora and the opposition, Iranian opposition. This is very fine lines that. Yeah, uh, I think I think you're being very generous uh, or or kind in the way you're depicting it. I mean, I perhaps a cruder way, or not perhaps a, a cruder way to put it would be to to say the world doesn't seem to give a shit about democracy in Iran when it comes to uh, enabling or dealing with the with the regime, unfortunately, uh, and and this is part of the challenge. But one thing that you were just saying that occurs to me, I, I've talked a little bit about it on the program that despite the frustration and the anger and the the concerns about the disunity say in the diaspora and and the timeline of how long is it going to take before a free iran etc there is a way to look at it that says these are things you know in terms of the the organization if you will of the global iranian community these are steps that we have to go through uh, they're either going to happen now or they're going to happen after some kind of revolution and i and i'm curious how important you believe it is to have say the the leadership question or some kind of an organizational question worked out before the the regime falls you've talked about the fact that as a witness to the the revolution in in 78 79 there was no plan. There was a you know a bunch of people who wanted to get rid of the Shah, and the lack of any sort of organized plan allowed the co-optation of, of, of you know this revolution that would lead to the Khomeinis uh, taking power. H how much should we be concerned about what happens next right now uh, before the regime falls, if it's going to do so? If we Iranian outside Iran uh, have not learned a lesson, I'm sure that Iranian inside Iran have learned a lesson. So that's why I'm saying that uh, nothing will go from here uh, inside Iran. The Iranian people have lived for 44 years under a despotic regime, and they are just paying for the mistakes that during this Islamic revolution the Iranian have committed. And so I'm very 
adamant to say that in Iran, the the decision that they're making, the the way that they're working, the the way that they're, they're protesting this regime and challenging the regime, they know what they want. Before the revolution, during the uh, Pahlavi era, we didn't know what we want. The Iranian people, they wanted Shah out. They know they did what they didn't want. But uh, I had a lot of discussion because I was not revolutionary at all. And I knew that I couldn't live under a a religious uh, regime. So I left Iran before two months before the revolution because I was seeing it coming. Yes. So I was talking to my colleagues in Kehan. Uh, we were just at Kehan and there was a big, uh, uh, I think it, there was a 60 days of uh, strike uh, by the journalists and they, we were supposed to go to um, to our um, post and sit down and not doing anything. But we were just talking, we were just challenging, we were just exchanging ideas. And I was telling them, uh, why are you going for a gentleman uh, that, that is uh, for a religious guy, for a religious leader? Why are you going after that? You are educated, you are journalists, you are writers, you are, uh, as they said, Roshan Fekrani, mm-hmm. Iran, you are the cream of the crop of the thinkers. And they said, that, let's let's do that first. Let's let's mm-hmm. uh, topple Shah and then we will decide what we're going to do. So this is not what Iranian people inside Iran are doing right now. They don't want to topple this government, and then after that, think what they're going to do. Mm. Inside Iran, there are so many people that can be leaders, that can be, uh, uh, after the revolution, this revolution happens, and uh, this government is toppled, they can run the country. Uh, They have learned their lesson, but we haven't. And because I, I believe strongly that we haven't learned our lesson, I'm a little bit, uh, not pessimistic, but I'm just, I don't believe that uh, from here we can just send leaders to Iran. I got you. So, yeah. I understand what you're saying. Let me ask you as a journalist how you believe we should treat this regime in Iran at this point. It is clear, uh, I say this as a statement of fact, not out of any editorial kind of position. It's it's clear that they're, that the leadership of the regime in Iran are a bunch of liars. I mean, they will say, uh, they will characterize protests as terrorists. They'll talk about a kid as, as some kind of a, a threat to, uh, to to religion. They'll they'll uh, they'll claim that they didn't execute or that they did, but it was for this reason or that. Uh, we know all of that. Where are you at with the way we should be treating the regime in, in Iran as media? I remember the last time you were on this program, that that interview we did three years ago. I asked you if you would interview Javad Zarif who was the Minister of Foreign Affairs for the regime at the time, you said yes, you, you would. Would that be true now, Homa? Would you would you give a platform to Raisi or Hossein Amir Abdullahian, the, the, the foreign minister now? As a journalist, you should uh, interview anybody. You can interview and you should interview anybody, but it, it, it all depends on the question that you're asking, all depends on idea that you have, you want to be a journalist with fact finding, or you're an investigative journalist, and you are a challenge, you can do challenge. And if somebody is talking to you, and you, you know that they're just lying in their answer to you, you should challenge them. And if you have that, this quality of a journalist, that is really, really the most important quality that a, a, a reporter or an a interviewer should have, Yes, you should interview. If you are interviewing with that, with that, and don't have any clue how to challenge the, the person that you're interviewing, is better not to. But if you're ready, if you have done your homework, and you don't, you 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 ask a question that you know the guy is lying to you in the answer, so you can challenge him and ask him to give you the correct answers, or or by just responding to him that he's lying and just having uh, your listener or your or your uh, audience know that he's lying, you have done your job. So I believe many of the Iranian leaders, of the Islamic Republic leaders who come uh, uh, outside Iran, who come to the United States, and there is a possibility for a journalist to talk to them face to face, they won't accept any uh, invitation mm-hmm. to interview 
uh, to be interviewed by people like me. They prefer to be interviewed by uh, journalists that uh, they are not challenging and they just mm -hmm. listen, they ask a question and they listen to them and go to the next question. And this is not good. I don't like that. And uh, when I t tell you that I'm, I would, I would interview, I have in mind that um, I would interview as an investigator, as a investigative journalist and also as a fact-finding journalist. Let, let me gen gently challenge you on that. Or here's here's the issue for me, because I'm 100% with you that journalists should interview everybody. And I'd like to think of myself as somebody who would want to, you know, interview Mussolini and get to the bottom of that uh, the ego and whatever it was. But, but uh, when it comes to these guys and the uneducated nature of the world about what's going on in Iran, you see, Christiane Amanpour had Abdullahian on CNN. And, you know, she did an okay job she sort of uh, challenged him a couple of times etc but and and i think for the majority of the mass majority of iranians who were watching that they would smirk or laugh or you know curse or whatever watching this guy say no nobody's been killed since the protests began you know i mean he actually said that in the interview but my concern is all of the other people who'd be watching who aren't iranian who are watching and are hearing somebody say something that these outright lies, it's not like Trump or somebody, you know, that they're used to, they know, or they, they've, that's some of that's baked in. They're just watching this guy who's a, you know, this uh, from some other place in the world who's saying, no, nobody's been killed. And the interviewer is saying, no, a few people have been killed. And they go, oh, okay, well, there's two sides to this. Maybe there weren't as many deaths as they say. And of course, there aren't two sides. You know, there's a, So that that was my concern with that interview, where I thought, why are we giving this guy a platform? I think the some uh, journalists that are interviewing uh, the members of Iranian government, they think that they are just doing this to give some uh, idea about the guy to the leaders or to government of that country, hmm. not for the general audience or general public. Because general public, you know, they just listen now and they just decide that. Uh, the way that you are telling me, they can make false decisions or they can just say, oh, yeah, there's two ways of this. But if the, the um, target audience is to to let the people of the government, the, the ones that can make decision know about this, this is different. So in case that you're talking about general public, I, I'm with you, but if these interviews goes, somewhere in the State Department, in the White House, mm -hmm. then this is different. And, and how much do you feel the need to fact check when you, if you were to report something? You know, the news came out today, just today, like a few, a few hours ago, I saw this, that the Iranian Foreign Ministry, a spokesperson for the Iranian Foreign Ministry, advised the French government and gendarmerie to exercise restraint and violations against the protesters and pay attention to the protesters' demands. I mean, you know, this is... Uh, how do, how do you treat that news? Is, is it even possible to report that without remarking on how absurd it is? No, you just say that he said so. And the fact is that it is a bunch of hypocrite and all this, you can say all this afterwards. You're just not reporting the news. If you report the news, then uh, you're right. I see some Iranian journalists in different TV stations. They're doing a great job in fact-finding and investigative journalism. Yes. And some of them, they're not, but uh, this is uh, the price that we pay in our career and in our job, but they, we have good ones and bad ones. So not the, the one that they, they can do the job and they can be a good journalist and a good interviewer should sit back, sit back and not do their job because they're bad ones. I think they should try more. How do you deal with all the noise around? You, you're a journalist, but... In recent months in particular, you found yourself in the middle of some political debates, some folks claiming you're a Democrat or you're anti-Pahlavi or you're wielding an agenda of some kind. Has has that surprised you? Did that, does that? Uh... Oh, no, I have been, I have been used to this. And uh, I always say is when you have, when whatever you do, there is a group that is for you and there are groups that are against you. And you, they, they two different people from two, uh, end of spectrum are criticizing you. One says you're anti Pahlavi and the other says you're Sultan Atalab and you're against this. And then you're criticized or you are uh, applauded uh, by different kind of different group and different uh, uh, thought. 
uh, I think you're in the right place. If all the time they applaud you, uh, there would should be something wrong. And if all the time you get just insulted or criticized, or you know that on social media is everything is very open and they just can insult you very badly. Sexual words that they use is, uh, and sometimes you can get frustrated and say, but you know that there is also a cyber army from uh, uh, Islamic Republic that just bring this to get you frustrated and not not to talk or not to write or not to give ideas. But uh, I have been used to it. And for the last year and last two years, to be exact, since Trump came to the power, Mm. uh, this kind of reactions has been uh, multiplied. But uh, none of these just make me uh, go back and sit down and not to talk. They cannot prevent me from giving my ideas and giving my, my point of view. You're not wrong that there's a variety of a, you're either with the regime or you're a monarchist or you're yes. or you're anti anti Pahlavi. I mean, uh, uh, that that's the funny one. Whether you're either a monarchist or anti Pahlavi, and and this it, it, just reading quickly through comments, it's not like uh, it seems like they can't decide. Uh, but are you? Do you look at these comments? Do you respond to these comments? Is it is it something? I I, I try to not even look at it. I mean. I, I sometimes that I have time, uh, extra time, I, I looked at read some comments, I never answer them. But uh, it gives me broader view of what the Iranian community is thinking about. But uh, I, I do my job, I do I continue whatever I was doing. And uh, sometimes also I get a little bit sad. Uh, because I think that even criticizing needs some, uh, there is some lines you cannot you should not cross but sometimes they cross lines and uh, they start just cursing my sons for example mm. right and uh, that one is like for me is the red line but still for that for that also they, they don't i don't answer because i know that there are sick people there there are just people with agenda and uh, there are all kind of people there and you don't expect that everybody uh, agrees with you or everybody loves you or nobody hates you. So this comes with the territory, with the territory. The, the community's not that big outside of Iran and, and, and everybody, you probably know everybody, you're probably on a first name basis with them all. Do, do, do they contact you? Does somebody contact you and say, hey, were you were you saying something negative about me? Or, you, or, or, or I mean, do you get those kind of calls or, or text messages? And yeah, a few, not not many, but, uh, but as I said, during Trump campaign and during campaign uh, Trump presidency, because I was against him, there was a lot of Iranian that thought that if Trump comes to the power, the um, revolution would happen in a mm-hmm. matter of two months. And he knew this. There's a lot of people who still believe that, and they yeah. and they live where you live in L.A. Yeah, I know. Mm-hmm. Mostly they're here actually, mm-hmm. and they were just. They were very angry at me and they said, you didn't let the revolution happen. He would have uh, toppled the government in a matter of months or two after he became president. And I would say, listen, this is not going to happen because no president in the United States, no matter he's Democrat or Republican, they would think about their own uh, benefit and they were their, their own interest. And they would not, nobody would do that. I even... Uh, bet with a couple of my friends who are very Trumpist that is not going to happen. And they, they lost. They lost dinner to me with the restaurant. But uh, sometimes I take it a little bit lightly. Sometimes I, I, I think that we need to be more educated to, to know how United States working and how the presidency in the United States means is not, uh, is not a matter of one person mm-hmm. deciding what to do. and. The, during the campaign, what they promised to do it, mostly they are not going to respect it after they become president, and they are not when they give you some some hope is mostly lip service because they are not doing it. They are not uh, uh, respecting their promises. I was going to say, I mean, uh, if the op- if the alternative to Trump is Biden, it's been. Um, it's been difficult watching the, the the Democrats have the presidency and and seemingly when at least when it comes to the Iran file seemingly have a almost a lethargic kind of uh, a position on this uh, and you know and and uh, every intimation being we're we're comfortable with business as usual if it continues the way it has. 
you see that uh, another news that came out two days ago, I believe, it was Mike Pence uh, going to Mojahedin uh, Khalq meeting in Paris. So no matter if you are Democrat or uh, Republican, uh, either you don't know, which I believe this yeah. is not the case, you yeah. know what's going on and you know Mojahedin Khalq and you know that they don't have any place in Iran between Iranians outside and inside Iran and you as a candidate for presidency you go and visit them and you you uh, give lectures you are one of their speakers in their meeting and then uh, how in the world you have been the vice president of Trump who would say he's going to just topple the government in a matter of two months and you are not meeting the Mujahideen uh, Hall in Paris and going to their meeting so they think that Mujahideen Akhal doing their job. They, they just find the uh, nuclear uh, plants and they just kill people. If they ask them to kill somebody, they go and kill them. So these are m- more helpful for them than uh, uh, other organization. And they go and they talk to them and they sit with them and they, they have a meeting with them. And they know that no Iranian inside Iran and no Iranian outside Iran are with uh, Mujahideen Akhal. Yeah. And and still they do their own job. They they do their own policy. They yeah, they believe that they can use them or whatever. It is always a, um, a pleasure and an education getting to talk to you. You talked about hope. Uh, uh, well, we talked a little bit about hope, the, the soaring hope and falling hope uh, a few moments ago. But before I let you go, are, tell me about how optimistic you are that the coming months will see the kind of change that people have been pining for for so long? I don't see coming months, but I hope that uh, this revolution happened while I'm alive. Well, that's another 50 years. (laughs) I hope so. You are very optimistic. (laughs) I am. But yeah, but that's that sounds like a way of saying for now, you don't believe that things are going to change. I mean, you're you're you're, in other words, the what what was created over the last few months well, has not moved the goalposts enough for there to be a downfall anytime soon. No, it's going to. You know, he's not going to change. The people are continuing to do that. The thing that I believe very strongly is that Iran will not go back before the day that Massa has been killed. We never go back to them. And you see that the the way that the Iranian women are against the hijab right now, and they are just. Uh, not accepting the hijab and the government find a way uh, a way to uh, punish them or to penalize them but uh, by asking money uh, for people who don't uh, who, women who don't wear hijab means that they are just backing off so it it will happen in its time in its time it needs uh, more perseverance and i see that in iranian people because they are fed up they yeah. don't want uh, this government anymore so they will they will reach that that uh, goal want. I spoke with a friend who had just returned from Tabriz a couple of days ago. He went there because his mother had died and uh he had to he went to the funeral and um he said the mood uh, and he's been traveling back and forth to Iran for many years. He said that the move the mood is un unbelievably dark when you say fed up, you know, people are just not not in a very happy place, um uh, to to say the least. Yeah. I know that, and and it's very sad. And let's hope that they can just reach the goal as soon as possible. Now that you've worked on the memoir for a couple of years, and the the Persian version came out in November, is there is there an English version that will come out anytime soon? I don't think so. But if somebody wants and likes to to translate it, I I would appreciate that. It's not my job; it's my job of somebody that speaks fluent English to be able to translate it. I think it'd be really wonderful if that, if that happened, and that, um, and uh, I can't wait till it does. Uh, Homer Sasha, I, I thank you as ever um, for the time and for the energy and for joining us today. Thank you very much, Jan, for inviting me, and I always enjoy talking to you. Merci, Chodafes. That is legendary journalist Homer Sasha joining me from Los Angeles today, and this is full time for Rook for today. Remember, for all things Rook-related, head to our website, rookmedia.com, rookmedia.com, where you can catch up on previous episodes, all of our programming, video clips, funnies, 
interesting edits, moments. It's all there. Rookmedia.com as well as a, a way to support us by pressing the support us button. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together. Smart Pega, Savvy Roham, Talented Anahita, Bearded Omid, Super Parisa, and Sound Person Louise. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you've not done so already. You can find me on Instagram and threads at Gian Gomeshi. In the meantime, Mizunbashi.